our webinar on the ABCs of using school records in your family history research. My name is Ginevra Morse. I oversee all of our education and online programs here at American Ancestors and New England Historic Genealogical Society. I will be moderating today's event. We are a nonprofit organization supported by our members and donors. We provide resources and expertise in nearly all aspects of family history and are pleased to offer such programming for our members and friends around the world. I also want to note that we are still broadcasting from our homes to your home uh, with various limitations and distractions. My dog is right behind me. Um, we do apologize in advance if there are any interruptions from our end and uh, we thank you for your patience. If we do lose connection on our end for any reason, um, don't worry, you'll still have access to a full recording on our website as well as our YouTube channel. So your presenter today is Chief Genealogist David Allen Lambert. David has been on the American Ancestors staff since 1993 and is an internationally recognized speaker on the topics of genealogy and history. He's published many articles in the New England Historical and Genealogical Register, the New Hampshire Genealogical Record, Rhode Island Roots, The Mayflower Descendant, and American Ancestors Magazine. He's also the author of A Guide to Massachusetts Cemeteries and is the tribal genealogist for the Massachusetts Ponkapog Indians of Massachusetts. His genealogical expertise includes uh, New England and Atlantic Canadian records of the 17th through 21st century, military records, DNA research, and Native American and African American genealogical research in New England. So in today's session, uh, you're going to learn how school records can provide insight into an ancestor's daily life, help fill in a timeline, and be a useful tool in cluster research. We'll look at a variety of different types of school records, including registers, yearbooks, report cards, directories, um, where you're going to find those records and how to use them in your own family history research. At any point during the presentation, feel free to type your question into the panel to the right of your screen. We'll address those at the end. Uh, there is no handout for this session, uh, but we are recording this event and starting tomorrow you can easily go back and review any of the content from today's session on our website. So if you miss something on today's first listen, don't worry, you can always go back, review the presentation later. All right, so without further ado, I will turn things over to David. Thank you, Ginevra, and welcome everyone. I wish we could all be sitting together and uh, having this lecture in person, but in a virtual world, as so many students are realizing now, uh, that this is the new norm. So genealogy. You've probably been very busy with it, and I'm sure you've got plenty of names and dates in your family tree. But have you ever thought that a lot of your ancestors were kids once? I never knew when my grandmother told me that she went to high school that that was physically possible when I talked to my 84-year-old grandmother. But then she showed me her photo from her graduation. The stories that we know of our own childhood and our own education as genealogists, we only yearn to find them for our grandparents and our great-grandparents. I hope that in the next hour we can discuss why you want to use school records. Now, the records may provide you with vital data, residence, etc. So like maybe the date of birth of your ancestor and where they were born. You may find out even information on who their parents were or their next of kin, their guardian. Uh, you find out the occupation and where they were living because where you live depended on where you went to school. Now, also, it will tie you back to your ancestors in a time and place. And like I say, I like to go into the stories where more than just names and dates, and during that little dash that's on the gravestone is that part of the person's story, their life. And school records can unlock part of that for you. Um, it also builds your ancestor clusters. That a whole idea of the fan approach, families, associates, and neighbors. The associates, these are the people your ancestors went to school with. Maybe that's how they met their spouse. Maybe they went to school with a larger group of people that they later went on to war with. They uh, were drafted into the service. Maybe they were longtime friends. Maybe you knew Aunt Sally. It wasn't really your aunt, but it was your grandmother's best friend from the time they were in grade school. And it fills in this dash, most of all, the stories. And let's look at what we can do with records. 
Now, obviously, one of the first things you want to determine is which school your ancestor went to. And you kind of have to examine that a little bit by looking at were they even in school. So the next thing we want to try to look at is what information we can find federally on our ancestors. Now, the federal census isn't going to tell you that they went to the Smith Elementary School on Main Street in Tewksbury, Massachusetts. It's going to tell you that your ancestor was a scholar. And where this is important with the ideas of child labor laws, certain years your ancestor may have only gone to school part of the year. They may have actually not even gone to school past the time they were 11 or 12 years old. So at school in the within the last year, that is recorded in the decennial federal censuses of 1850, 60, 70, and 80. The 1890 is gone, so we're not even going to touch upon that. In 1900 on the federal census, it will tell you attended school, the amount of months that they attended school. So that's an important fact because if you look at the amount of months they're attending, are they working for part of that year? Is it not just the summer break? So you might find that they're only a part-time student versus a full-time student. Now, 1910, 1920, 1930, ask you whether or not your relative attended school anytime since September 1st of the census year. So that means they attended, doesn't mean they didn't get kicked out midway through October, but it shows that they were enrolled at the beginning of the year. And in 1940, the most recent census that we have until the 1950 gets released in a couple of years, uh, the 40 asks you attended school or college anytime since March of 1940 and the highest grade of school completed. That is a really important one. Now this might be our parents or grandparents or uh, aunts and uncles generation and this is going to give us a clue that like oh yeah dad did have to leave school when he was 12 to go to work during the 1930s because there was a great depression going on maybe you have stories and maybe that story will be fit a little bit better when you look at the census and of course the censuses you can find on a variety of places like family search and ancestry.com to name a couple all right the one thing that you need to do, and I think this is very true with genealogists, we have to be local historians. Even if the local historian is not the town we live in, we need to understand the complexity of the history of a town and understand the fact that we know our ancestor lived there, but what was going on? How many schools were there? So learning the educational history of your ancestors' community could be as simple as putting in, uh, looking for a website that has a historical society's page. It may be uh, finding a digital book on Happy Trust or archive.org, like the history of Sunderland, Massachusetts. There's probably a page in there on churches, military, and also on schools and education. And maybe you'll get recollections of what schools were there, the old little red schoolhouse, down to uh, maybe a school that was segregated in your community. Maybe there was a school that was only for boys or a private school. You need to understand this before you start looking for records because there's not one index to look at. Now, one of the things that you may overlook um, for these details, because we're gonna look for that lovely bound history of the town, or maybe find a website or find something online that spells it all out. That may not be the case. So sometimes you're gonna to have to drill down into the records. One of these things that you can use are there usually superintendent of school or school committee that had to give an annual report. So in the published town report or in the town meeting minutes, you may find a listing of the various teachers in schools that existed. As we have here in this um, listing from Center Harbor, uh, it has Elver Bickford and Mary C. Fall as the grammar and primary school teachers in this uh, town in 1950. You go down further, you can find other teachers that are here. And But what's even best is you're finding out who the pupils were. So here we have in the Meredith schools in grade nine, you have Evelyn King, John Pike, and Patricia Sidney. Grade 10, you have the following. And in grade 12, there's only two students. So maybe they've gone off to work uh, or moved out of the community. Okay, so moving on 
these are published town reports. They're even handwritten ones. Now this may not list all the students, but as you can see from Rowley, Massachusetts from the town report of 1821, nearly 200 years ago, this is telling us about them voting to choose a committee for repairs in the schoolhouse. So we know there's a schoolhouse there. And then there's another vote to choose a, uh, a committee to look at suitable place to set the schoolhouse out and report of the enjoyment of the meeting. So one of the things the schoolhouses were also used for besides for students, a lot of town meetings were held there. So it was important to have this structure. Town meetings were often held in the first parish church or the schoolhouse. And sometimes they had different school districts. So you might have a record of school district three, who the teacher was. So knowing where your ancestor lives in the community, you may look at an old map, 19th century maps often will show us where our ancestors lived along certain roads. And they're also gonna point out other things like churches and schools. So you know that in Tewksbury, Massachusetts in school district three, that's where your ancestor lives. So now you need to find where the old school records if they exist for school district three in the town. The other thing is that a lot of these books, we can't get to now because of COVID, but because of the Internet Archive and archive.org, doing just a generic search on town, annual town reports is very easy. Just putting in those key search terms with the name of the town itself, as that is how I found the one for Center Harbor in 1950. And you can just pan through them, but the nice thing about archive.org uh, in the Internet Archive has OCR or optical character recognized the words in the book. So you can search on the Thompson School or a teacher's name that you may have from a family uh, postcard or a diary or a recollection your grandmother told you and maybe narrow down what school based upon the name of a teacher that you may already have. So a, a real big tip here is to look at family heirlooms for clues on what school your ancestors attended. Because you know when that trunk up in the attic that you haven't looked at for years probably has something of yours, but does it have something of your parents or grandparents or even generations before? So let's talk about some of the things that you might have. Now, early on, students were given school books. And a lot of times you, the town may have provided a school book, but a lot of times they didn't and you had to supply your own or buy your own. So maybe you have an old 19th century school book that your ancestor carried and they maybe wrote their name into the book itself. You remember when we were in school, we had to put our names in the book and of course there were names of previous classes that may have used that same textbook for years. These type of things are really our genealogical record because it is telling us who was there involved in that school at that time. In the case of this student's record, he may have even done doodles in it or may have written notes or maybe even drawn an embarrassing picture of his not favorite teacher. <laughs> so look for these type of school books in your attic. The other type of books you might find are autograph books. I know that when I was in junior high and high school every year, I had an autograph book at the end of the year to collect the signatures and the cute sayings and poems that classmates would uh, put in. It was a big thing that for me in the 70s and the 80s. And autograph albums will show up and they're Family collections that we have at NEHGS in Boston of over 28 million manuscripts, we will have autograph albums and some of them are actually from students. So maybe you have something like that. And then what's great, that fan approach, you have the associates, you have the people that your relative went to school with right there. The other thing that kids are great for doing is scrapbooking. In fact, it was all the vogue in the 1990s. It goes back till the colonial periods where people would tuck away certain things. May have just been uh, a reward of merit, somebody tucked as a page holder in a family Bible to something in the 19th century where they clipped off different pieces of their school drawings or programs from a school dance or maybe even a ticket from an event that they attended. School scrapbooks are wonderful because it's more than just a one dimensional, this is my ancestor and this is when they went to school. This is their school years. And uh, I hope that you have one of those for either yourself, parents or grandparents, or maybe you can start to recreate it by the research you find. School pictures are wonderful things. 
they've been taken since the 19th century. As you can see up here, this is a little one room schoolhouse actually that still stands down the street from my home. And these are kids that are unfortunately not all identified. Then you have grade school photographs from the 1970s. Doesn't look too far off, except we're inside the gymnasium. Uh, incidentally, this little kid right here, that's me back in the 1970s as a six year old. And then of course, yearbook photos, the dreaded yearbook photo to try to capture something that's gonna be there forever. As a high school student, this was accumulation of all your years. You're gonna put in details about your clubs, your sports teams you're in, your nicknames, where you're living, any variety of things. But once it's in a yearbook, it's forever. So hopefully you didn't write something you regret. But maybe you can find one for your ancestor back to the early 20th century. And some of them even are yearbooks for colleges or alumni directories that even go into the 19th century. The other thing that besides yearbooks that you might have are gonna be programs from things that your family attended. How about if it's the graduation program, the ceremony itself, maybe something from a school dance or from that amazing football game that your dad was in back in the 1950s where he won uh, the game. And that program is something that he treasured and it was in his belongings. So as you start to dissect the belongings of your parents and grandparents and great grandparents, you may of course have less as the generations go back, but you'd be very surprised if your family were collectors like mine were, well, I could open up my own version of my family's National Archives. The other thing that you might come across when you're cleaning out those trunks or looking through closets in your family's home are the old Letterman jackets, maybe the cheerleading outfit that your mother wore, or maybe the majorette's hat that your aunt had and she lived with you uh, later in life and still had that up and would take it out occasionally on New Year's Eve parties just to be silly. But this is a connection. Now, keeping in mind that we don't have a lot of things for our relatives if you move or there's been a fire or something like that, remember local historical societies may have a sampling. So this jacket that I own, it belonged to someone who graduated my high school in 1955. This is his junior year jacket. I know the story. He went to the local Army Navy store, he decided he didn't want it anymore. He sold it to them. I purchased it and it's gonna be going to our local historical society. The family didn't want it, but it doesn't mean that their great grandchildren from these people that we donate things for may not be looking for it. How amazing it would it be in 50 years or 100 years for someone to say, what do you mean you have his jacket? So. Keep in mind that we should save things. And if we can't care for them ourselves, find archives or local historical societies or the school itself might have a little museum or display that would be a caretaker for such things if you don't feel comfortable doing so. High school rings. I'll tell you, people with metal detectors find these all the time and we uh, find on social media where people, I found a class ring with the initials on it and they went to this high school. People zoom online, look for yearbooks, try to figure out who it is to try to return it. Maybe somebody lost it on the beach back in 1962 and never saw it since. This is where these things show up. Or maybe you have your mom or your dad's high school ring or even your grandparents. Inside there may be an inscription or initials and what you really should do if it is initials, you should put a little piece of paper with it to identify who it belonged to, because you know it, maybe your grandkids won't. And lastly, if you may have a diploma, from a diploma from primary grade school to middle school, junior high, to high school, to colleges. Diplomas are the culmination and are loaded with genealogical data. It has the name of the student, when they graduated, where they graduated from. You have that fan approach, so you get the associates, you can find maybe the principal or the superintendent of schools or the school committee signed it as well. What a treasure it would be to have the diplomas for each one of our ancestors that completed grade school, high school, or middle school. So keep your eye out, local historical societies. Now school records, are gonna be something that you may have at home. And you're thinking to yourself, why would I have my school records at home? Well, in a way you kind of do. 
report cards. So here's an example of an 1877 high school report card. And to be really honest, it doesn't look a lot different than later on in generations. So here you have the student in September, October, November, all the way through the end of the school year. It's telling me how many dates they were present, absent, they were late, when they were dismissed. Uh, and then it gives me a, sort of a grade point out of 100% how good of a student they were. Well, um, Bertie Goldweight did a pretty good job. She has some pretty good grades. And here is the signature of her parents. You know the way our parents had to sign our report cards? Well, sometimes it was on the envelope, sometimes it was on the report card itself. And at the end of the year, we got to keep it, right? So you may have your report cards, which are something you may or may not want to show your kids, or your grandparents or your parents or an aunt and uncle save them. They're such a valuable thing because not all schools saved a copy of these. And we'll talk a little bit more about this shortly. But let's see some other report cards. Here's a different style of report card. This is fast forwarding uh, to early 1950s, where you're going from a percentage of a grade out of 100% to a letter grade, A, B, C, D, F, et cetera. And you're finding how the person did. You're telling, they have all the different classes they take. And again, the grades are here. Uh, occasionally you'll have attendance on there as well. They'll um, have any guidance or discipline problems that they may have had, how many days absent. So there's, there's a lot that's similar to 1877. And of course, you have the parent's signature over here as well. This is a report card from the 1930s for a grade school student, and that's not much different. Uh, you can find that the uh, number in the class, so based on the, the enrollment, you know that there were 29 children in this classroom. She's in the first grade, 1935 to 36, during the Depression. She was absent uh, a number of days, times late, once. Overall, pretty good student. The teacher's name is right there. So now you have that fan approach. You can find out about the teacher. And we'll talk a little bit about researching the teacher later on. And these are where you're going to find these clues. And of course, the parents' signatures right there as well. And why not show you my report card? This is from about 100 years after the first one. This is when I was uh, in the fourth grade back in 1978, 1979. Looks like I was an overall good student, had some trouble with social studies, which is kind of funny because I later got my degree in history. So apparently I improved, I think. But this is the same elements, the same grades. Uh, for my report card, my parents' signatures aren't on here because this report card slipped into an envelope. We got to keep the report card, the envelope went home to the teacher. So it was just proof that my parents saw it and I didn't feed it to the dog. So <laughs> report cards are so great. So I hope you have some of yours and you're willing to share them with your kids. You wanna utilize local newspapers for graduation, honor roll, sports and other related news. And with websites like Genealogy Bank, newspapers.com, there's just so many different ways that we can search on our ancestors. So think of when they were kids, not just when they were adults. You might find out about the role of honor or the kids that graduated from the local school as this list from 1870. The other things that you might find are team photos and newspapers that your parents or grandparents may have saved. Here we have a high school team uh, of a girls basketball team back in the day. We find that this article from the 1920s was a high school team that won a football uh, where when they were playing back against another team and they took a team photo that's in there as well. So sometimes newspapers may fill in the blanks for you and you may get that extra surprise with a photo. So team photos are great, especially when they're identified. Now here's a clue, a clue here. You might have a photo, you know that the person with a little X under it is your grandmother. Who are the rest of the people? You wanna know for the fan approach to research them as well go to the local historical society, see if they have a copy of the photo. At our local historical society, we get donations. Sometimes they're fully identified because someone wrote them at the time. Sometimes there's one or two names. You may have the one with all the names and benefit other people because now you help them identify their grandmother.
The other things are alumni directories. Now here's one from Harvard University in 1913, and it's giving me a variety of information here on individual people. Here we have a William Bartlett Lambert, uh, who was a graduate in 1872, that he lives in South Boston, and gives his address, so I know when he actually attended Harvard University. You find other people here with a variety of other degrees they received and where they're living. So this way you can do that fan approach and find out other people that went to school with your ancestors. Maybe there's a diary or a letter or they kept a scrapbook that will add more light and bring to life the story of your ancestors school years. May it be grade school or college in the case of Harvard University here. Now, the one thing that you need to look at is the yearbook. If you find that there is a high school yearbook, you kind of need to understand and look at a lot of the entries to dissect what they're saying here. So we have an Edward McGilvery here who's known as Ed. Uh, he planned on going to college. He was in the basketball team, the football team. He was a captain of the football team. He was the president of the sophomore class. He was on the ring committee, the picture committee. Now, it may not seem like a lot if you're flipping through it, but when you find your mom or dad's or your grandparents' entry, these are stories you wouldn't have heard of. How would you remember your grandfather was on the ring committee at his local high school? It's at Dash. We're finding these stories. We're bringing their school life. Now, they have no voice anymore. The records speak for them. Maybe you'll find activities like home economics, field hockey. They were in cheerleading. You might find a goofy photograph of them, and it shows a human element besides the posed high school photo itself. The other thing you might find is that your ancestor, well, might have been in the academic or sports hall of fame in a local high school. And um, I'm honored to say that I'm in the academic high school hall of fame in my school. Uh, there's just a little picture with the date I graduated, right? Oh, there we go, right? I am right here. And, um, but it's something. And in a hundred years, maybe one of my descendants will find it and look back and say, wow, he was a goofy looking kid. <laughs> but there may be records in the school itself. They may have the reason that a person was elected to the Hall of Fame and give more detail. The other thing that you wanna start looking at or what's available online for your school. Now, in the case of state and county school censuses, not every state and county have them, but there are some. Family search, great place to search. You wanna drill into the state level, the county level, and then into the town level, if you will. As you can see, Oklahoma school records, 1895 to 1936 on family search. One of the things that I found for an example here is here is a school census for Kingfisher in district number 46 in Kingfisher County. And it has the uh, name of the pupil, their date of birth, and this is a clue. And it also tells me the parent or guardian. So I know that in the household of Rachel Hamlin here, that she has John, Minnie, and Rosa are our kids, and there's their dates of birth. So they know who is being enrolled in the school, and it has to fall into play with both enrollment, school taxes, how much allocations they should have, and how many teachers they need per county in each district. Now, in search of the teachers, now, a lot of us have teachers we loved, and that same thing is true with your ancestor. So do you think that they may have written something or kept a diary of when they were working in the school, kept a scrapbook of all the photos of all the kids they had, those class pictures identified because they wrote it down? You almost want to track down the teachers of our parents and grandparents and great-grandparents if you can, because it may give you information. Superintendent, the superintendent of schools in your community may know where the former teachers are back to a certain point. Now, obviously they may not know one from 1895, but they may know where the teacher is from 1947 or when she may have died. There may be an alumni association for your town as well. Now, the other thing that you're gonna find are registers for teachers, as in here's one from Apache County, Arizona in 1895, listing teachers and when they worked. Now, 
We're going to talk about a couple of different specialized schools. Uh, one of them is the records for state schools of deaf and blind students, and that would be the Perkins School for the Blind. And this would include information such as the story of Helen Keller and Annie Sullivan. That's part of a major part of their collections, but they also have enrollment records of students and pupils. If your ancestor had been blind, they may have attended the Perkins School of the Blind, and there may be some records for them. Contact them and you can uh, find out more. The one thing that they do seem to have is some really great finding aids and the collections that they have. They also have photo collections of things that are in their archives. So maybe there was something that your ancestor had as part of their curriculum, uh, a braille book or a certain way of learning that is part of their archives. This is true with any university archives. that They have elements or things that represent each one of the decades when the students were there. So that might be something to try looking at, especially in the case of the Perkins archives. One of the other things that you'll find that most archives have, as well as academic archives, you'll find a finding aid, a variety of things that they have. So there's a variety of things that are listed here, such as the census of the blind in 1840 and 1890. Uh, you'll find different concert programs. You'll find different things that exist on a particular person involved. May it be a teacher or the uh, superintendent, things that may add to the element. So you have to think outside of your ancestors as a person. Think of the time frame that they're actually in a school, such as the Perkins School for the Blind. The other thing that you can do is you can actually reach out to them and contact their archives. Now, the other thing is a lot of things are becoming digitized. So the annual reports, newsletters for schools and organizations for the deaf and blind in the United States and Canada exists. And these annual reports in cases go back to the 1880s. So you may find that, and that's just for Alabama. So you can scroll down through the archives and find out what they particularly have. And it doesn't have to be associated just with Perkins in Boston. It could be with any institution throughout the United States and Canada. Here's an example from FamilySearch. Uh, this is from the state of Maine, Return of the Blind, Deaf, uh, in 1864 to 1877. Now these images are already available because there's a camera right here, so there's no key above them. So you don't need affiliate access to look at them. And these might be of use to you if you believe that you may have had a student who was deaf or blind in the 19th century in Maine. Again, looking at school records on the state level to the county level to the town level. And sometimes on the town level, they may be mixed into town records. Here's an, uh, a record from Hartford, Connecticut from the Asylum for the Deaf and the Dumb in the 19th century. You have the name of the student, you have their residence, the county they lived, their age when admitted, and when they were actually admitted itself. So this is an alphabetical listing, and this could just be a key to other records or folders that exist. So when you find records like this, this is usually the index, if you will, to maybe a case file. So you wanna dig even further when you find places that have these indices. Now, the one thing that you wanna find also is that you're going to look, that maybe you have a Native American heritage in your family. The schools for the American Indian schools, like the one in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, are just some of the schools that may have been on reservation or been a federally uh, financed institution where they would educate uh, American Indians. So let's look at some of these records. So the first place I wanna to go to is archive.gov, the National Archives in Washington, DC, has administrative records relating to the American Indian schools. And this is a really great place to begin your search to see what schools may have been associated with a particular tribe. So you can find that they may be state or reservation schools, or they may have gone out all the way to Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Now here's an example from Family Search, and this is um, the 1911 Indian Census for the Carlisle School, and that is available to look at on Family Search. Take a peek at that. 
And this collection tells me that it's one roll of film. It's part of the National Archives uh, series of microfilm. And it tells me that the records cover 1885 to 1940 under the Indian Census Rolls collection. And this is specifically for 1911. Now, this is an Indian census roll from 1917 for the Cheyenne and the Arapaho Indians out of Oklahoma. And you have a rather interesting way of finding you have both their Indian name and their English name. And you find the relationship to the person in the census itself, as well as their date of birth. So you're getting each one of the students right there listed. And this could be a way of using, say, the 1920 census and the 1910 as a census substitute in the middle, let alone uh, it's an Indian census role giving both the adults, the mother and father, and the children. One of the things that you may also find are school records. Now, the school records on Family Search are going to vary, and this is the case of the school records for the Bureau of Indian Affairs in Pipestone. Now, and this uh, is in the Kansas City, Missouri Archives, uh, the branch of the National Archives out in Missouri. These school records uh, for the Pipestone Indian School Enrollment uh, on Family Search give you by the grade of the person. We're giving us the date they entered school, and then it also gives you their parent or guardian. And if they left school, it tells you the reason they left. Um, so this is the listing of um, grade school students 1945 to 1946, and this collection does go a little further back. So you may find people in the 1940 census, and this just brings the family just a little bit further with their kids before the 1950 has been released. Locating the records itself. Now, this is where it gets a little bit more difficult. Now, obviously, finding the records at home, maybe they're finding that the family itself has uh, schooling at home. They're a, a, a homeschooled child that maybe they were taught by the mother or father. You're not going to find very much records. Are the records at the school itself. Many universities have their own archives, and many high schools are the place that the school records are kept. So if you're a homeschooled, probably you're going to need family diaries. If you're in a public school system, it could be in a variety of places, or even in historical societies if they were transferred. We're going to look at a little bit of local repositories and things that you can search online. It's as simple as using Google for finding the superintendent's office in the local school district your family went to school. Now, public school records, as a rule, are not very accessible if you are not the direct person associated with the record. So essentially, it's like you have access to your children's records or your own. You're probably not going to have access to your cousin's records as much as you'd love to look at how they did in uh, biology class for their grade, because they always toted that you did uh, worse than they did. Records are closed to the point that you need to be the person, either the legal heir, maybe you're the uh, executor of your mother or father's estate, you can prove that the person is deceased. They may not open the records, so there are some restrictions to these. But the first place you want to try is the superintendent of the public schools in the town or the county that your ancestor lived. Now, this is the part that's tough. You have to ask them how far back they kept the records. Give you a case in point. Myself, I graduated from high school in 1987. When I graduated, I figured my school records were there forever, including even my bad science grade from a long ago. About five years ago, there was an ad in the local paper. Anybody who had graduated before 1990, you have two months to come to the school to get your records. We're purging them. Yeah, purging them. This wasn't just the case. I got my school records. They've only kept a small amount of information, essentially a listing of what schools I went to when, when I graduated, really a small transcript. Case in point, go back a, maybe 100 years ago. Back in the 1980s, I contacted the local high school my grandmother went to school with, Milton High School in 1914. I wanted to find out about who her teachers were. I was doing some genealogy. I figured that they had a listing of the grade schools she went to before high school. 
They were so excited to send me a package in the mail. They sent me her original report cards they still had in the school from 1909 to 1914. The sad thing is that they told me that they were delighted to send me this, that they didn't even know they had this collection down there, and they were going to purge all these records. I locate, contacted the local historical society and alerted them that these may be in jeopardy. I hope that they were able to save them all. I have my grandmother's, though. Local repositories to find archives that may have school records. So the Boston City Archives is one of the places I'll talk about when I show my case study. But you want to use something like Archive Grid. You can put in certain search screen uh, terms and search for school records right there. Now, it doesn't mean that's going to be the superintendent of schools, but it may be a place like the New England Historic Genealogical Society. We have a private school in Boston, the records for this uh, lady who kept records on her students in the 19th century. That's something you might find in a collection on Archive Grid. You may find that there is a county historical society near you that's gathered up records. The Archive Grid under the search of school records is almost 4,900 records. Here's the school records from New York State from 1803 to 1896. Uh, and this is for the town of Murray. And it has these very early school districts. As I had mentioned, school districts within a town have their own records of students and the teachers that they had. So you can find things. You just need to drill down on the local level. To look at that record from the New York State Historical Documents, you may find that it's actually, there's a link and it's actually online. So you can browse through the records right from home or maybe they're in a particular archive facility that you would need to visit after COVID, or you can contact them to have a search of the records for you. When you do school record searches, the nice thing about it is it's also going to tell you when you need to get to the archive, you put in your address how far away it is. So I know that this archives in Albany is going to be 146 miles from here, and then I know that I could do these, the research on these different districts. Now, are there more? Is there a finding guide? That's what you want to find out about. And the most important thing on school records, find out if students are listed. Again, it's important to learn the uh, school history of the community or the school district your ancestor went to, but even be better if you could find details about your ancestor from these records. The other places that you can find alumni directories are online. Uh, you would have to be a member of the Yale alumni. You could sign up uh, and get an actual login. But this is a place where people reconnect. These archives and alumni networks are great because they may have started digitizing old yearbooks and alumni lists. And also as a way to reconnect with someone that may have gone to school with your mom or dad. Uh, putting out, I'm looking for members of the class of 1947 who's out there. Ancestry.com has a variety of things available online that you can search. Here are some, just some of the databases they have between school yearbooks, school catalogs, student lists uh, from the 18th to the 20th century, uh, different other regional lists, Arizona school census, 1910 to 1917, South Dakota, Pennsylvania, and Connecticut. And as you know, more and more things are being digitized both at American Ancestors and other websites around the world. Family Search, you can go into school records in a catalog search. Just go to Family Search's catalog, put in school records, and then you can drill into the actual records on that state, county, and town level. There are over 26,900 records. Uh, it's, it's amazing. So instead of school records, you may just try a keyword such as a yearbook or alumni directory in your catalog search with, of course, the name of the university or the town in particular. Now we're further searching down on the exact town and city it really is the smartest way to do it, but you want to start broadly at first. Try records on the, fed, on the state level, the county level, then the town level. American Ancestors, we're happy to show you that we have colonial collegians of major universities between 1642 and 1774. We also have an amazing collection of original 19th century broadsides of all the graduates from Lowell Masses High School in 1837 to 78. These are really unique and they're 
very amazing looking little collection. Uh, they mentioned about Mrs. Rousen's Academy, that Boston teacher who had a private girls school. This is from 1797 to 1822. And we have a fascinating collection, including photographs of his school children from Deer Island, Maine in 1883. Now, Colonial Collegians, the database on American ancestors, has a variety of different universities and colleges associated. The College of New Jersey, which is Princeton, College of Philadelphia, which is University of Pennsylvania, College of Rhode Island, which is now Brown, William and Mary, Dartmouth, Harvard, King's College, uh, and Queen's College, renamed after the Revolutionary War, obviously, our Columbia and Rutgers University, and lastly, Yale. And this covers anybody who attended between 1642 and 1774. So that is on our website. Let's do a search. I'm going to just put in one of my ancestors I knew that went to school in the 18th, 17th century, and his last name was Thompson. Not even going to put in a first name, and I'm going to hit search. Ironically, because it was one of the earliest people to graduate with that variation of the surname, he's right up on top. So Reverend Edward Thompson went to Harvard University in 1684. If I click on the camera icon, I am going to be able to now see a little biographical sketch that was written about him. He was born in 1665 and he died in 1705, he was 39 years old, but it's giving me all of the information. The Harvard alumni books were taken from Sibley's Harvard graduates, and there are other books for Yale and other ones that were transcribed or uh, digitized out, so we have all of the material right there for you for this important part of colonial history. Finding your books on the shelf. Well, obviously there are places you can find them. Hopefully you have it at home, uh, but a library or a school university archives or li may have the actual yearbooks of previous classes. And that may be on the local high school level as well as the university. The university archives are usually great because sometimes they don't have just the yearbooks, but they have all the material and the layout, blue, uh, the blue lines, if you will, laying out all the yearbook pages itself. They may have had scrapbooks or things that weren't included in the yearbook that they intended to. The guidance offices of a school, and especially on the high school level and uh, grade school, may have these little yearbooks. Now, yearbooks are not just for high school. I had one in middle school, and I know that we had some handmade ones in grade school when we got out of the sixth grade. So you'd be surprised to see what might be still in the school system. Local public libraries, local historical sites are another place. You can also search for yearbooks online on places like classmates.com, as I found mine available online, including me in the actual index. Now, Classmates is a subscription, but you probably have Ancestry. But I'm going to talk to you about how wonderful it is to have yearbooks online, but you got to be careful. So I'm going to look for myself on the virtual Ancestry.com schoolbook yearbook collection, uh, 1900 to 1999. When I did a search for my name in my hometown, I came across a group picture. I was on the school newspaper, and I thought, that's interesting. Where's my yearbook picture? So. That was fun. I just said, well, let me try my, a different variant of my name. So I hit another search. And I found under Dave Lambert, there's a goofy picture of me at the junior prom in a tuxedo, which I wish was not online. But just to show you, use name variants, especially the nicknames. So this is one way to find it. But the ironic thing is I didn't find my high school yearbook picture. When I clicked on the one from the school paper, there's me being very uh, debonair with my leather jacket. Um, I went backwards. Ancestry didn't scan the pages for our class pictures. It went right to the previous class and it kind of morphed the two books together. But have no fear, my yearbook is online at archive.org. And so why couldn't I find it when I searched on David or Dave? I have to worry about the misspelling of my name that somebody did back in 1987. Yes, my name was Dave and David, but they decided to combine it and make me Davy Allen Lambert. Oh boy. So I had to find a name and search it the wrong way to find myself. Uh, gives you my nickname, uh, certain things I am not sure why I wrote back in the day. I like CD radios and uh, different sayings I had and a, sort of a dedication to the family and friends that I uh, wanted to be remembered uh, for loving back in the day. 
dissecting the yearbook for clues. And we kind of did this a little bit earlier, but I just want you to show how variety of things are listed just between these three students here. So we have Ronald Leaf, Charles Long, and Virginia Lowe. All of them have their address. All of them have their, um, their nickname. Saying what they're gonna do after school. He wanted to go into the commercial field. He, she and Charles wanted to go into the, co uh, to co well, Charles wanted to go to college. Virginia was gonna go commercial. Different things they were involved with. Their ambitions, their pet peeves, their past times, their favorite song. Is this something you don't have for your parents or your grandparents? Finding their yearbook will add this human element. But knowing the different groups that they were associated with, maybe that that's where you want to look for school records for um clubs that may exist maybe somebody kept a scrapbook of the chess club or maybe you want to look through the newspaper now because you know that your ancestor played baseball in high school was he a good pitcher or an outfielder maybe there's something about the band or a school play you want to find out if your grandmother was in that school play it says she's in the theater club dissect the yearbook for clues it really is a detective's work but you'll find Wonderful thing. So let's talk about some strategies here. You want to create just in Excel a school spreadsheet for your ancestors. So I've kind of changed the names a little bit around here and some of the dates. So I've got my parents, grandparents right here, hypothetically. I have where they're living. And then I kind of did the math. What years would they have been in grade school? When were they in high school? When were they in college, if you know that somebody attended college? In the case of one of my grandfathers, well, I know he didn't graduate high school because he enlisted in World War I up in Canada. I know that my grandmother did graduate in 1914, but I wasn't so sure about my dad's mother up in Moncton, New Brunswick, Canada. I know that she's in school in 1912. Did she drop out as a 12 or 13 year old? This is where you start to collect. Now you have this set of tabs, uh, you then go to another tab, cut and paste this, and then you could say, I checked with the superintendent's office, no records, the school burned, no records, found them on a school census. I found a class photo in a historical society, creating a research log for your student ancestors. You want to use social media uh, to your advantage and create a Facebook group to locate students, especially even if these are people you went to school with. You can share photos, contact classmates that may have known yourself or your parents, uh, plan future reunions for your class and reconnect with former teachers. You can even form a scholarship fund, uh, maybe for your class that never had one to begin with. And of course, best of all, sharing memories or finding out memories about your parents or people that knew your relatives. My high school class has a Facebook group I created. It has 243 members on it. And I put the last time we got together, anytime there's a uh, someone is getting married or sadly when somebody dies or if somebody's having a virtual get together with coronavirus, I put that online and we have a Zoom meetup uh, virtually hanging out like we did in school long ago. Now, I decided I'm just going to take on more than that. I created one for my entire high school. And as a local historian, this is great. We had a question a while ago when our school mascot, where the name came from. I knew it was done in the 1950s. I said, all students are graduated 1953 to 1956. Can you answer this question? Or you throw a photo up there as a historian, and you know that three people are identified in the 1968 class picture. Maybe somebody on there will say, oh, I know who that is. That's Sandy and that's Tommy. They dated together. You get these great stories behind a photo that's posted. We have over 5,000 photographs that were done by a photographer, a school teacher. We didn't know who was on them because he never wrote it on. We've identified 75% of them already. You want to visit the school or sites where the schools your ancestors attended. And I'll kind of talk a little bit about this when we go into showing you how I did a case study for my, my mother's family. So my mother grew up in Boston in the city of Dorchester and Roxbury and then later moved on to another town. And here's my mother's card. Now this comes from the Boston City Archives, originally part of the Boston Public School Record. There's a couple of things on here I wanna point out. Obviously you've got her name, her date of birth, and 
Uh, was she vaccinated? There's something that you know is school will require vaccinations. Ironically, it has her birth date wrong. She wasn't born in January. She was born in February. The name of uh, her parent or guardian, that was my grandfather. Maybe he forgot her date of birth. <laughs> he was a laborer. Where they were living before they went to the Boston school system, the school she attended, the date of discharge from the Boston school system, and where they lived in Boston. So what's a little confusing is here we have the place they lived in Boston and then where they went after they left. Now, because my mother would come back from the grave and haunt me, I'm not gonna show you my mother's school record, but I'll show you my aunt who probably wouldn't have cared because she was just like that. So here's my aunt Phyllis. She was born in 1932. My grandfather's a painter, it's her address. It tells me they're living at 1340 Dorchester Avenue and they later went to 107 High Street in East Denham when she left. On the right here, I can see the date of admission itself. So this tells me that her age when she entered in kindergarten, she was four years old. The initials of her teacher, using the fan approach, I will contact the Boston City Archives and say, can you tell me in 1937 at the Southworth School who a teacher was with the initials MEP? So that way you can find out a little bit more. And if it gives me her age when she was five, she's in the first grade. Uh, she was in the second grade twice. Uh, enrollments here once in September and 11 because they uh, changed her teacher, not that she had to stay back. Uh, and then it goes on to that she was at the Mather and the Southward School, same school that my mother went to. Now, what I wanted to find out was what was the Mather School like? What did I do? I Google searched it and I came across a picture from the late 1940s of what the Mather School looked like inside. And I was like, well, I wonder if I can visit it. I'm sure it doesn't look like this anymore, but I still wanted to see the location. Of course, I will use an old atlas and I'll try to figure out that I knew that my family lived around the corner on Adams Street, so it wasn't too far of a walk for school. Uh, there's the Mather School right there. And I said, okay, now I'm gonna use the coordinates here. I'm gonna say Church Street, Winter Street. I'm gonna use Google Earth and try to figure out where it is now. Before I do that, I wanna be certain I have a good picture of it back in the day. So I went on and I was able to find the school pictures from the Boston City Archives of the different schools. And I searched for one on the Southworth School and the Mather School. What I found is the Southworth School right here in this brick building is the Mather. Little quick history note, this was the Mather School. They built the new Mather School in 1905 and they renamed this the Southworth School. <laughs> I was a little confused, but I still wanted to see where my mother and my aunt went to school because I had that in the records. What I did realize is that I could find that the Mather School had a postcard online. I bought that on eBay and conveniently next to it is the Southworth School with a flagpole. Now I decided, all right, I have to see what this is. So I went on to Google Earth, figured I'd get to see where my mother went to school. Now the flagpole's there, the Mather School is there, but as you can see, the old school is now a parking lot. The Mather School they went to later still stands, is still a school uh, to this day. However, the old 19th century school isn't there. Saves me a road trip, I can do this virtually from home. Now, one of the stories I show that my family went from Dorchester and they went to Dedham. So I always heard these stories. They moved out to the country. They had to walk so far in the snow. You know the stories our parents told us. They walked five miles barefoot in the snow backwards. Every year the snow got deeper and every uh, year the, the distance got longer. Yeah, let me show you something. Uh, my mother said in 1940s that she lived in East Dedham. That's her address, 107 High Street. Yeah, not exactly that far. See, they lived in this house right here, and this is where my mother went to school when she was 11 years old. That must have been a terrible commute to roll out of bed in the morning and have to be at school. If she was ever late for school, I'm sure there was no way they could actually explain that to the teacher or the principal. So anyways, sometimes family stories are a little exaggerated. In the attic, I hope that you find something like a diploma. Or maybe in your family research, you have a graduation picture. This is my grandmother's graduation picture from 1914. I want you to look at this and realize it's more than a one dimensional object. Use your genealogical and family history sleuthing skills, research the places, 
research the schools, the associates, the people they went to school with, maybe even create a web page on it to try to find out from the memories of those that knew your parents. It's more than just the years they went to school. It's a chapter of that dash. And thank you very much for uh, attending today, and I'm glad to take some questions. Well, thank you, David, for that fantastic uh, presentation. Let's see if you have any questions. Go ahead and type them into the chat panel. I know that we're, or the questions panel, I know that we're just about at time, but we'll leave about um, five to 10 minutes for some questions. Um, so Jane asks, you know, before I throw out high school yearbooks, where should I consider donating? Well, high school yearbooks are very important, uh, and I wouldn't throw them out. I would contact the local public library for where that high school is, because you may assume they have them all, but they may be missing years. Our historical society, another place, our public library has a set of the yearbooks. Our historical society has another set. So we were able to take our duplicates and give them to the public library, but we're always getting donations. And why is yours unique? because you have inscriptions and notes and maybe other things tucked in it that's specific to you being a student or your parents. So they're all important. And I know a few questions, a few people are asking about, you know, do school records exist for New York City? Do they exist for this certain place? How do you really go about uh, seeing if school records survive for any given location in the U.S.? Because there's really no standard um, process of when they have to get rid of them. I mean, generally speaking, uh, in Massachusetts, some of the school systems get rid of them after 25 years. Uh, however, there may be other places like my grandmother's high school that still had the report cards down in the basement from 1914. Um, you want to, again, work locally, contacting the superintendent schools office and say, listen, my grandmother went to high school here and graduated in 1905. Do you have anything on the class of 1905? Maybe they don't have any records. Then you contact the public library. Do they have a yearbook? Does the historical society have a photograph? That's when you create that little group on Facebook and say, hey, listen, or find a group on Facebook that exists. Does anybody have a photo or any information about this class? You also then wanna look and see if there's a graduates list in the newspaper. So if you don't get that positive answer, keep trying on different angles. Now, the other thing is that the school records may exist uh, only for a certain time frame, but they may have other records that complement it, like the yearbooks and the photos. So don't give up. 1800 school record, 1800s era school records are rare. They, not that they don't exist, they're just gonna be harder to find. And more likely they're no longer with the schools anymore, they might be with the historical societies or a state historical society. Um, and Don asks archive grid. So you showed us, you know, using archive grid to kind of explore different collections in archives and other local repositories. Is that a pay for service or is that free? That is absolutely free. I use it all the time, especially with reference questions uh, that come into American Ancestors, because sometimes Google isn't uh, always the quickest answer. And I want to find a, you know, a finding guide or a link to something that might be digital. It may already be an archive grid. So take a look at that, as well as Googling Lexington Public School Superintendent and contact him and see what records survive. And if you do find something in uh, WorldCat or in Archive Grid, um, and you can't get it because of COVID and closures, what do you suggest? I mean, do you suggest at least trying to reach out to um, the, those repositories, visiting their websites? Is there some other way that you can access those materials listed? Well, the best part is that the records exist. Just, just having a little bit of patience. Uh, this is a very trying time. and. You don't know if that archives or historical society has staff uh, in the building at that point in time. So you might wanna start with just simply sending an email uh, or if you get a mailing address, send a letter. Say, I'm really curious about the 1917 school records that you have I found on Archive Grid or WorldCat. Uh, what can you tell me about it? Is there a finding guide you can email me or can I pay for a service from your institution to have you search out for my grandfather's records. 
Great. And I see uh, someone also commented that uh, the Allen County Public Library also accepts uh, yearbook donations. So that might be another place to, um, to potentially send your yearbook. I would contact them in advance first um, before you just kind of ship it. But uh, that's certainly a repository that you can check out. Um, Let's see, uh, I know that there are a lot of questions. Um, a few questions about kind of Catholic schools, parochial schools, do those records exist and how would you go about uh, finding or accessing those records? Do you wanna check with, of course, the uh, parochial school records or if the school is closed, uh, you wanna try if there's an archdiocese archives that facilitates both the church in the area. So the school is probably connected uh, with the church and whatever archdiocese oversees it. So you wanna start on that level. Now, if the school is still open, it's quite entirely possible they have the records, depending how far back it goes. Um, the better it is uh, when you find that the school is still standing and it's the old building from 1910, well, the building wasn't torn down, the records weren't thrown out. It's just the process of how long they kept the records for. I find with parochial school records, they're just about as difficult as they are to get public school records. Uh, my dad had a brother who went to a parochial school. He is deceased. I contacted them. I had to provide the death record of my uncle to get a copy of his records, which was nothing more than a transcript. It wasn't his report cards or anything like that. Um, but they did have a school picture of him, which is really nice to have. And if um, a few folks have are saying that they have teachers in their family history, um, how do you go about uh, Maybe you could give some tips, you know, to learn where they taught, if they went to a, a teacher school, if they got certification. Um, what, how do you kind of start that research looking into teachers? That's a really good question. Um, teachers are obviously so important. I'm proud to be a dad of a teacher. Uh, and where you have to start is really, if the person was still alive, obviously the best thing to do is to interview uh, someone who has that knowledge themselves person's deceased, maybe something's in their obituary. The obituary might give a clue to the college or university they went to for, t for training, and that way you contact the university that they attended. Now, there may be an alumni association for that university. That will drill down to what's going on with the teachers now, you know, say 50 years ago. It may say the schools that they're attending. The nice thing about newspapers.com and Genealogy Bank is you can search on a name and then put in school or a town, other key words that they might come up. Um, for instance, the house I live in, the school down the street, the teacher lived here in 1907. I found in a newspaper a Christmas party she was holding in my living room in 1905 for her students by using newspapers.com. So you may find stories like that. Again, that whole fan approach, if a teacher in your family, you know somebody who may have worked with her, or better yet, create a group on social media and say, are there any students of Mrs. Uh, Suwick's nursery school still around? I'd love to see hear about stories and photos, or a high school teacher or a coach in high school football. You may find that crowdsourcing it might help you too. All right. Well, thank you again, David. I know that we weren't able to answer everyone's question today, um, but you can uh, schedule a consultation with David um, directly if you have, um, you know, questions about school uh, school records, military records, New England. David does a lot. He has expertise in a lot of different areas and uh, he's happy to work one-on-one -on -one with folks. So if you are interested in uh, scheduling that service, you can sign up uh, through consultations at nehgs.org. Uh, if you have, if you've hit a brick wall and you just need more hands-on help with your research, you can also hire our research services team and you can learn more about that service by contacting research at nehgs.org. Now, before we say goodbye for the day, I do want to share with you a very special offer. This is actually kind of giving you early access to a special promotion that's launching this coming Monday. Um, but if you are thinking about joining NEHGS, American Ancestors, um, and you haven't been a member before, you can save $20 um, when you join as a new member. Just use the discount code SUMMER 
GEN2020, um, and you'll save $20, and that expires the end of August, and I'll be including that information in my follow-up email, as well as a link to the recording. Um, and again, there was no handout for the session, but you do have access to a full recording, freely av available. You do not need to be a member to watch the recording. Um, and that will be available both on our website as well as our YouTube channel. So I just want to thank you again for joining us today. As you leave the event, you'll have the opportunity to fill out a survey and give us your feedback as we continue to expand our webinars and online offerings. Any and all feedback is extremely helpful and appreciated. This free webinar was made possible by the generous support of members and friends around the world. Please consider making a gift to American ancestors to keep these programs free and to create more free programs for you and audiences around the globe. If you'd like to access more how-to resources or learn about upcoming online educational programs, please visit our online learning center at AmericanAncestors.org slash education. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you at our online programs in the future. Best of luck with your research and goodbye for now.